after you're here. Today's webinar is titled Inspiring Ideas to Help Students with ADHD Succeed in Your K-8 Classroom. My name is Suzanne Leslie and I am a Curriculum and Instruction Specialist with Learners Edge. And we just want you to know that every day we talk with teachers who are just like you and who are seeking strategies to help them in the classroom. And because we understand you're always looking for ways to improve your teaching and your student learning, we put together this webinar with the hope that you can take these suggestions and put them to use in your classroom right away. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items to help you understand who you can participate in today's event. On your screen, you'll see a screenshot of an example of what you should be seeing as an attendee. You should see something that looks like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right corner. And most of you have already are uh, using the audio on your computer, and if for some reason that method is not as clear, you can feel free to listen via phone using the numbers provided on your attendee panel. We encourage you to send in your questions as well throughout the presentation. You can use the question pane of the control panel that you see there. Send in your questions at any time, and what we will do is we'll collect them and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's session. If we run out of time, we will do our best to send you responses after the webinar. Also, you will, the webinar will be available on our website, and we will email you the link to the webinar and all of the information that we've provided you with today. Thank you so much for taking your time out of your busy day to join us. And with that, I'm thrilled to introduce my colleague. Her name is Jill Rockwell. You see her there on the screen. Jill is also a member of the Curriculum and Instruction team at Learner's Edge and joined us after more than 13 years uh, of working as a special educator in uh, Wisconsin and in California and in Minnesota, which is where we are right now, speaking to you from Minnesota. Jill's excited to share with you some of her best strategies in working with students who have ADHD. And with that, we'd like to welcome you, Jill. Thank you, Jill. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you, everyone, for being here with us. We are going to start by defining ADHD which is an acronym for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. According to the National Institute of Ma Mental Health, ADHD is a brain disorder involving a constant pattern of inattention and or hyperactivity, impulsivity, that interferes with functioning or development. Here in the United States, approximately 5 to 11 percent of school-age children are affected by ADHD. This brings us to our first poll. Wait for it. it looks like it came up on your screen. Yeah. So the first question is, how many students do you have in your classroom with an ADHD diagnosis? And we'll give you some time to select. You can see on your screen you have the choice of one to two, three to four, or five or more that have an ADHD diagnosis. So we'll give you a few moments here to respond to the poll. And then once the poll has been closed, we will talk about what we see. Yep, and this is an official diagnosis. Oh, looks like the results are in already. Wow. Thank you for your participation. Uh, as you can see there on the screen, one to two is 46%. Uh, so almost half of the people that have responded to the poll are saying that 46% uh, were one to two students that have been diagnosed with ADHD. And as you can see there, 30% are saying three to four, and 25% are saying five or more. Is that typical? Yeah, that's typical. Still? That's right on average. Um, well, for a classroom of 25 students, that would be approximately one to three students. So right on target there. So ADHD does not look the same for everyone. Um, there are three presentations of ADHD, as you can see on the screen. Predominantly inattentive, predominantly hyperactive impulsive, and a combined inattentive and hyperactive impulsive presentation. I also would like to point out that the presentation of ADHD may change for individuals over time. For example, a young child may be diagnosed with hyperactive impulsive ADHD, and then later as the child grows older and is expected to focus longer developmentally, he or she may be reclassified as having a combined presentation of ADHD. So as you can see on your screen, there are several symptoms of ADHD. And like I said, the symptoms may change for individuals over time. This list was based on the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Health Criteria, which is published by the American Psychiatric Association. 
So I'll let you take a look at the list. It's um, categorized into the intensive presentation and the hyperactive impulsive presentation. Some common things you might see among your students possibly does not seem to listen, trouble organizing, easily distracted, or fidgety, leaves their seats. Um, in order for individuals to be officially diagnosed with ADHD, children through the age of 16 must display at least six symptoms in either or both categories. Um, and then individuals 17 and older must display five symptoms in either or both categories. So after reviewing this list, we're going to go on to our second poll, which is how many students do you have in your classroom that you believe may have ADHD but do not have an official diagnosis? We'll give you a moment to answer that. Again, it's how many students do you have in your classroom that you believe may have ADHD but do not have an official diagnosis? So go ahead and select uh, your options there again are on the screen, one through two, three through four, and five or more. And again, we'll give you a few moments to respond. Fifty-four percent is the uh, is the highest, and that number is one through two. So again, that's in keeping with what mm -hmm. the statistics say. Yep, that's with the national statistics. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you for your participation you. in the poll. So we will be getting to the strategies for a second. in a second. I know that that's why you're here. But first, um, we are going to take the opportunity to hear from a child. This is Julia on your screen. She has ADHD. So we are going to hear from her. We're going to hear about her struggles with paying attention. And then we're going to experience what it's like to struggle with focusing with a simulation activity that you'll actually be observing me participating in. And then you will hear from a doctor who explains the struggles associated with ADHD. Um, this website, understood.org, is a, a wonderful website full of valuable resources that I'd encourage you to check out. Um, so we're going to we're going to hear from Julia, like I said, and then um, when when I do the simulation, you're going to hear a lot of background noise, and that's normal. It's a true representation of what it's like to have ADHD for a child who's not able to block out all the, the background noise. So here, oh, and as you're watching the video, would you please jot down your thoughts as Julia describes her struggles associated with ADHD and then your feelings as you observe the simulation exercise. Just jot a few things down. So here's Julia. My name is Julia, I'm in second grade, and paying attention is really hard for me. When I have trouble um, paying attention and go daydreaming, my daydream land called La La Land. All I know is I'm spacing out, and it's kind of like I can't see anything. It makes me sad because I can't, I can't, like, really... Mm. I was in La La Land, and they called on me, and I had no idea what was going on, and it was super embarrassing because I had to think of something that I could stay to, like, save me, and everyone was kind of, like, making fun of me, and they were judging me, like, differently. For some students, it can be really hard to pay attention in class. That dog barking outside the window can seem so much more interesting than anything the teacher is saying. This interactive feature will give you a taste of what it's like to have trouble staying focused. Okay, so here we go with the simulation. Okay, put away your book. We're going to play a game. In this game, we're going to find homes for the animals. Listen to me carefully. In front of you are some animal cards and a grid. I'm going to tell you where to move each animal card so every animal ends up in the right place on the grid. Are you ready? Everyone take the snake card. Now let's see. The snake card is on the camera in the grid. Got it? Good. Now 
take the bird off and put it on the kangaroo the tree. Dylan, are you with us? <laughs> okay. Now take the monkey. Put it on the I tree. I don't have a monkey. Is that yours on the floor? <laughs> <laughs> now no, find the kangaroo no, part. Oh, and the monkey. Emma and Maggie, pay attention. <laughs>
And we'd like you to share any strategies in the question panel, and we will compile a list of strategies to share with everyone so we can have a plethora of strategies to walk away with. Yeah, okay. So again, I encourage you to check out understood.org, participate in a simulation activity. In addition to the um, attention simulation, there's a simulation for a reading disability, a writing disability, and math disabilities. Okay. Okay, so there are five common struggles for students with ADHD that we will be addressing. The first one is paying attention slash focusing, like our friend Julia completing tasks such as homework, projects, and tests. Organization, um, we'll be addressing losing things, having a messy locker or desk, regulating emotions and behaviors, and social skills such as developing and maintaining friendships. So we're going to get, here we are, here we are for the strategies. You know that that's what everyone's waiting for. Um, so we'll be addressing the five common struggles by offering strategies to help your students be successful. So let's get started with paying attention and focusing. To support students like Julia from the video with paying attention, I tailored my lesson plans around student interests and strengths. So in order to learn more about my students, I used to facilitate a share time every day. This is when students would have the opportunity to tell the class what they did over the weekend, or they would share something they were looking forward to later in the day. Then I connected lessons with interests whenever possible. So for example, I used recipes and cookbooks to teach math concepts, such as fractions, to a student who loved to bake. Um, the recipes also motivated her to read and follow step-by-step -step instructions, which is a skill that can be challenging for students with ADHD. So, and I recently read an article about Michael Phelps. He's our Olympic champion, of course, and he has ADHD. Um, the article I read was on attitude mig or ADTitudemig.com. Um, His mom, Deb, explained how she encouraged Michael to read by offering him the sports section of the newspaper, and she gave him books about sports, which interest, interest him, interested him, and motivated him to read more. And then when Michael was uninterested in math, he had a tutor who modified word problems based on sports. On swimming. So for example, um, one question might be something like, how long would it take to swim 500 meters if you swim 3 meters per second? So those are some examples of interest-based learning. So next, um, to manage both hyperactive and inattentive behaviors, I incorporated movement breaks several times throughout each day for my students. This might have been as simple as standing up to stretch, striking a fun yoga pose, or taking a quick lap around the school. And then at least once per week, I would throw a one-song dance party. Um, I am, my dancing skills are about as good as Elaine's from Seinfeld, if anyone watches Seinfeld. <laughs> um, but it truly was a great way to re-energize and refocus everyone involved. My students made song requests for upcoming dance parties, and they invited special guests such as the principal. So um, even short movement breaks provided an energy release for my students, which helped refocus and relax them. And then I just want to point out there's, and I'll have all the resources that I mentioned will be at the end um, of the slide, so you don't have to write anything down if you don't want to, but um, there's a website called goldnoodle.com, and this provides short videos that will get your students up and moving and, um, and focused as well. There's some relaxation videos as well, so um, I'll address that more at the end. And then by providing, you can encourage active class participation by providing mini dry erase boards to write responses on. Have your students give you a thumbs up or a thumbs down for yes or no, which is a great way for you to check for understanding. And then have students turn and share with a partner during the discussion so that everyone can be heard when, when the whole class, when you don't have time for the whole class to share. And the next strategy is to use visuals. Um, visuals are a great way to remind and encourage students to focus. So this could be as simple as a student, a student sitting quietly in their chair, or it could be um, the eyes, as you can see on the screen, as a reminder to look at the board, 
or it could be an ear or a, a, a pair of ears, like our little, cute little basset hound on the screen. Um, so you know your audience, um, you know, what's going to help them focus and not distract them. And then the last strategy for paying attention focusing is preferential seating. This could be in the front near you, or it could be in the back to allow students to stand up and move without distracting others. Um, it could be using stand-up desks if you have that available, or the, the large exercise balls to sit in, or the stand-up desks with the little, the little um, foot swing on the bottom. That gives students an energy release without moving around the room. They can still be moving as they're sitting and learning. The second common struggle for students with ADHD is completing tasks. So one strategy I use to support students with task completion is to segment long-term projects into short-term tasks. Written language is the most common area of academic need for students with ADHD. So here's an example of a five-paragraph writing activity that I created for my fourth graders with special needs called My Dinner Party. Um, as you can see, it's into specific tasks with due dates. So I have the overall instructions on top. And then I may just give a student um, paragraph one, the introduction due Monday, with the instructions. So, so basically, I gave clear instructions and a clear specific due date as well, which can help prevent students from becoming overwhelmed, especially with writing tasks. And then other suggestions to support students with task completion, which are often IEP accommodations and modifications, include providing an extra set of textbooks at home, allowing extended time to complete tasks, providing a separate setting to complete tests and assignments, maybe the resource room, the special education resource room, or um, the library, and then having tests read aloud to students to help them focus on, um, on the question rather than um, allowing tests read aloud to students is a common um, accommodation that we make for many students um, with ADHD because it, it just allows them to focus better on, on the task um, and if they're in a separate setting. Um, and then during independent work time, I used a timer to encourage my students to work on a given task until the timer went off. Um, so a timer helps with, also helps with segmenting work time. So for example, depending on the student's level of focus, I would have them work for 10 minutes and then give them a two minute break and then repeat. And now there's some great timer apps that I'll address at the end of the, of the slide, of the presentation. And then last, to help students complete tasks, I implemented a homework chart. Um, here's an example of one I used for a fourth grader with ADHD. Um, this student, Sam, struggled with completing homework during study hall with me and then at home with his mom. So I partnered with Sam and his mom to create this chart. We worked together each week to set a goal with incentives. The goal was e easily attainable at first. and. Um, to get student buy-in and to help keep him motivated, and then we gradually increased the expectation. So this chart was directly linked to Sam's IEP goal of work completion. So I was able to use this to collect data um, each week and to, to write the progress reports and then to update the annual goal later on. So you can see if I, um, the tally mark is a reminder to work, and then five or fewer reminders was a smile. So um, he, his goal this week was seven smiles, and he earned 10 minutes of iPad time at school, and then a movie night with his mom. So it's really beneficial to have the parents on board, partner with them if possible. Um, it seems to be so much more effective that way. And then the third common struggle for students with ADHD is organization. Um, students thrive, um, especially students with ADHD, thrive when they know what to expect throughout the day. So posting a consistent daily schedule or class agenda in my classroom helped my students stay on task during instruction time and or 
conditions. And then when there were inevitable schedule changes, I would inform my students in advance whenever possible. So again, I have another little Michael Felt story. His mom saw the value and benefits of keeping Michael on a consistent, structured schedule, with, which consisted mainly of schoolwork, nutritious meals, she believed in low sugar meals, and swim practice to keep him focused. And he was very focused and consistent with his swimming. You could even find him swimming laps on Christmas Day. And next, allow for transition time between classes and activities so students don't feel rushed and end up misplacing materials. It's important to give them a chance to wrap up what they're doing first before expecting them to start something new. And then require students to use planners and other organizational materials, maybe a color-coded organizational, organizational system or an accordion binder. Um, whatever works best for individualized needs, it usually takes a little trial and error, um, but students do need explicit instructions on how to stay organized, and they need a lot of upfront support. Um, it's also beneficial to have them write their names on write their name on everything. So get a sharpie and have them write their name on absolutely everything. And then last is the check-in, check-out time. Check-in time provided an opportunity for students to start their day ready and organized for the day. Students would come to my resource room and I would check their planners and homework for completion. Sometimes I would keep students with me for 10 to 20 minutes to complete work. That way they'd have a fresh start to their day. And then check-out time was at the end of the day where they I would make sure students had all their necessary materials to complete their homework. And let's see, I have an example of an end-of-the-day checklist, a real basic one. This is um, a success story, I, like, I, I would consider, because this student initially required my one-on-one -on -one assistance with getting organized at the end of each day, but eventually he was able to get himself ready to go home with all necessary materials with this simple four bullet checklist. So the checklist allowed him to be independent, which is our ultimate goal for students. Um, so, and as adults, we also do have checklists. Um, I know my husband, for example, before he heads out the door for work, he always goes through his verbal checklist, which is phone, wallet, keys. So every day I hear him say phone while he to make sure he's prepared. Um, and then and this weekend I'm going away and I've already started a longer written checklist because I need that too to stay organized and make sure that I have everything. So it's good to, for students or children to see us use strategies like this to help us too. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, we're on the Fourth area of struggle for students with ADHD is regulating emotions and behaviors. Students with ADHD often experience feelings with greater intensity than other students, and they need support with regulating their emotions. So some go-to calming strategies my students include deep breathing, slowly counting backwards from 10, requesting a walk to the drinking fountain or to the bathroom, doodling, reading a book, listening to calming music, and squeezing a stress ball. So it's important to note that students should learn and practice calming strategies before experiencing strong emotions or losing control. We used to practice various techniques as a whole group on a regular basis. Um, so find a time that works for you in your class. Maybe it's first thing in the morning, maybe it's after lunch, maybe it's both times. Um, just find something. You can have one student choose a strategy and lead the group in practicing. And just like all those that you have listed there, Jill, uh, coming in from teachers and those of you that are participating in the webinar today, uh, to go along with this list, you know, including all those things that you have there, uh, fidget was one that was recommended. Know, like Julia. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and they also said that fidgets are a good, a good strategy because it doesn't single out those students diagnosed with ADHD because all students can use those. Mm -hmm. um, also, classroom movement activities, just like you said with the dance party and Julia Louis Dreyfus that we mm -hmm. saw earlier in the slide. Koosh balls, uh, weighted lap animals was an interesting one. Scented neck wraps, 
chewing necklaces, which I'm not sure exactly what chewing necklaces <laughs> are, but it sounds like something that might be kind of fun to do. Uh, noise canceling headphones, a privacy shield so students feel like they have a separate area if they don't yeah. have, you know, if you don't have the ability to have a separate workspace. And then another one that came through was a dot sticker on the desk that the teacher, or the, I'm sorry, the participant says that he or she quietly taps to help that that student refocus, kind of like mm -hmm. in your example with Michael Phelps. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that came through today. Okay, thank you for sharing. Those are great ideas. And it does take trial and error. Uh, I'm sharing a lot of strategies with you, and I realize that they're not going to work for all students. These, didn't, these strategies didn't work for all of my students, but, um, you know, we just want to give you as many tools as possible. And we appreciate the extra ones as well that we'll be able to share with you all. Okay. Um, okay. So we're still on the calming strategies. This is a, a visual that I had posted in my room. That um, these were the, their favorite strategies that my students like to use. Um, so visuals can be really effective um, to help students regain control of their emotions because processing a visual is easier than processing words. So. Um, so in the same article I referenced earlier about Michael, um, his mom told about a time when Michael got so mad when he came in second place at a swim meet. He was so mad he ripped off his swim goggles and threw them on the ground. So his mom had a heart-to-heart -heart talk with him about sportsmanship, and then Michael and his mom agreed to a visual hand signal, which was the form of a C with her hand. And um, which was a reminder for compose yourself. So Deb, his mom, used the hand signal whenever she recognized that Michael was getting frustrated. So and that reminds me of the participant who, who said the, the dot on the desk. Mm -hmm. It's something that the, the teacher, the educator, and the child or the parent and the child need to agree on. They both have to, it, it has to work for both of them. All right, um, let's see, moving on. Um, so other, other strategies for regulating emotions and behaviors include scheduled breaks in the special education resource room. This is a proactive way to manage behavior. I, I have another success story. I had a student come to my room to take a break after lunch each day for about 10 minutes. Um, this was a student who was not able to get through his afternoon with some sort of a meltdown. He was in second grade. So we started implementing a break after lunch because lunch is such a stimulating, crazy time of the day. Our lunchroom was so noisy. Um, so he used to come to my room, teaching another small group, but he would come in, he would set his own timer, and then he would read a book quietly by the window, and then when the timer went off, he would... Um, get up and head back to his classroom and be ready to learn. And I know it seems like too good to be true, but it worked for him. So a simple, just some downtime to decompress after lunch really helped him get through the afternoon successfully. And that, so it doesn't have to be an elaborate strategy all the time, you know, real simple break. And then behavior charts and contracts, you may be familiar with these. Um, I have a couple examples of behavior charts. Um, these, let's see, here we go. Um, the one on the left is a self-monitoring chart I used for a fifth grader. And just like our students are so unique, their behavior charts are also very unique, um, this, this, this fifth grader did not want to have a chart that was going to be seen by other students. And he really only struggled during a couple times during his day, his non-preferred times. Um, one of the times was during his reading group, which is a small group, separate setting. Um, he really struggled with those expected behaviors, being respectful, following directions, and listening quietly. So we developed this chart that he carried to his reading group. And it was just between him and his teacher. He carried it in his pocket. And he, um, the student and his teacher um, talked about debrief just, you know, 20 seconds at the end of class, how many reminders he needed. And, um, and it was just a way to collect data and, and measure change, which was helpful for him. 
the student on the right, or the chart on the right, was for a student, a third grade student with ADHD, and she needed more accountability, and she didn't mind carrying a chart around. Um, you can see the tasks. She had it with her during all of her tasks. Um, the expected behaviors are on top. Quiet voice, do my work, hands to myself, and be respectful. Um, so she also needed some motivation and incentive. <laughs> so she earned a smile when she followed her expected behaviors, and then five smiles equaled a spin. We, I used to have a giant spinner that um, students could spin at the end of the day for a prize. And then I gave her some extra encouragement on the bottom. You can do it, Sarah. So you can see a very different, um, but you know, I needed to do what was what worked for my students. It's definitely not a one size fits all behavior chart. Um, if I were working with younger students, I worked with kindergarten as well, I'd have a lot of visuals. The morning meeting would be a picture of a, a group of students sitting in a circle. Reading would be a book. So, so it would look different depending on the age group. Sometimes charts don't work at all for students. Sometimes students, um, they lose them either purposely or not, <laughs> or they just, they maybe they're embarrassed, they don't want anyone to know that they have a, a chart. So a contract is another option which can be revisited weekly, monthly, whatever, whatever you decide. Um, again, everyone has to have buy-in. So here's an example of a pretty simple chart that I, that I used with an older student. Um, I think the student was in sixth grade. So we had his expected behaviors on top, um, and then privileges, con possible consequences, and then a date as to when we would revisit to see if the terms of the contract were met. And then I did always try to get parents involved with the contracts. It just helped. And then I had a copy at home, a copy at school, and then we'd revisit it. So a contract is another good way to help manage behaviors. And then again, all of the charts are tied to their IEP goals, so the expected behaviors are tied to their IEP goals, and it's a great way to um, gather data, which helps with progress reporting. Okay. See? The final area of struggle for students with ADHD that we're going to talk about today, anyway, is maintaining friendships and social skills. So the first one, study buddies. This is when I would carefully pair students for group tasks and as, um, to assist with beginning and the end of the day routines. Um, so for example, if I had a student who was really struggling with organization, I might pair him with um, another student that is organized and patient and kind that could help him out. And then also, it goes the other way, too. I would find strengths of my students with ADHD and allow them to shine, too, by pairing them with someone who needs extra help. So if I have a student who is really good at math, I might pair him with a student who's not so good at math and needs a little extra help because they deserve a chance to shine as well. Um, I had a student with ADHD teach me how to play chess, which was a lot of fun. Chess, not so much, but it was just fun to see the student in his element. And he was just so patient with me, and he was so passionate about it. It was just really cool to see that. And then once a week, I used to host a lunch bunch in my classroom. And this basically just provided a little more of an authentic setting for students to get to know each other and to, to develop friendships outside of the cafeteria, which can be very noisy and overstimulating. And I basically served as a facilitator as needed to keep the conversations going. And then social groups, um, social skills groups, provided more structure than Lunch Bunch. And this might be part of the service minutes on an IEP, which would include role playing, um, working on problem solving skills, maybe playing games to work on taking turns and sportsmanship and leadership. And this might be done with a special education teacher, it might be done with a school counselor or a school psychologist. Um, so that's another good option. So I know I gave you a lot of strategies. I mean, there's def definitely not a one-size-fits-all approach to learning. Um, 
but I, you know, I found many of these strategies to be beneficial for my students. Um, so I wanted to share them with you. Um, we don't always have control of the factors that impact our students, but we can be prepared with strategies, such as the ones I shared with you today. So, and that's what we're hoping that you are going away with today. Um, number one, strategies to help your students be more successful. Number two, an increased sense of empathy for students with ADHD. Again, I encourage you to check out understood.org um, to do a simulation exercise. They're pretty powerful. I did all four of them, the, the reading, writing, math, and the focusing one, and they're pretty, pretty powerful. So, so understood.org, there's other resources as well. Um, and then the Michael Phelps articles I was referring to were from, I think it's ADD, like Attention Deficit Disorder, and then Etude Magazine. I think that's the ad, Etude. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then um, GoNoodle.com, that's where you'll find a plethora of videos that you can use with students, and they range from you know, a few seconds to several minutes long. You can choose the duration. You can choose the category. If you're looking for something to help students get up and moving, you can select that category. If you want students to quiet down and relax, um, you can use it for that. So you have to sign up, but it's free and it's very easy to use. And then all the handouts are provided for you that you can download now or they will be emailed to you with the entire presentation. Um, the handouts include the charts, the contracts, the visuals, and the slides from the presentation. And then on the right are a couple of timer apps that I use. Um, the one on the left is more of a fun one, but might be a little <laughs> overstimulating for some kids. It might cause more distraction, but it's a fun one. Um, the one on the right is awesome. We had, a um, when I first started teaching, we didn't have this app. Um, but this is a lot cheaper. I know you have to pay for it. It's $1.99. But the, these visual timers were, you know, $30 to $40 for the big ones that we used to buy, which is neat because it shows elapsed time and how much time remains for students. It's just a, a nice, handy visual. Okay. All right. I think that is it for my part. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Help? Interesting, all very worthwhile and interesting information. And once again, as Jill mentioned, you can download the different things that you saw, the different resources. And we will be emailing you with the uh, presentation today. And it will be available on our website. So that's www.bluebridging.com. A lot of questions. Uh, besides the handout question, we had a question which I thought was particularly interesting. It was, the question was, how can you protect students with ADHD from being victims of bullying? I thought that was was a worthwhile yeah. address. Yeah, yeah. I'm thank sure you. you know the answer. Well, I, I can. <laughs> I have some answers. Um, I think with bullying, the key is prevention, and to prevent prevent bullying, it's important to have adequate supervision, especially in the more unstructured areas like the playground, the lunchroom, the hallways, um, just having a lot of supervision of adults. Um, I would like to note too that students with special needs are more likely to be bullied than students without. Um, so I think it's really important to teach students how to report bullying too um, and to teach them that being a bystander, um, you know, what, what their duties are as a bystander as well. Um, and then I would really focus on um, teaching students to be um, sensitive of different needs and strengths. Um, and you know, within your morning meeting time or school meetings, really focus on um, the unique differences of individuals and how awesome that is. And we should celebrate differences. So just to reiterate what Jill said, um, she mentioned that it's more common for students with special needs to be bullied, so pay attention to that. Also, you said that adult supervision is imperative mm -hmm. to just keep it at bay. Uh, to teach students to be sensitive and to embrace differences. To teach students how to report and to focus on strengths mm -hmm. in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. okay, another question coming in to us is, 
Uh, how can we use technology to help students with ADHD? And I know you went over that mm -hmm. a little bit at the end here with your resource list, but is there anything else that you'd like to add? Uh, yeah, um, well, let's see. I, I mentioned the timer app, um, the gonoodle.com. Um, I did have a student who um, who was always losing his planner, his, his paper planner. He hated carrying that thing around. <laughs> and um, But miraculously, he never lost his iPod. He stayed with <laughs> him all the time. That was much more valuable than a paper planner. So instead of using, instead of fighting it and getting finding new planners for him, um, I had him use his iPod calendar as, as his planner. And then he also used the camera on his iPod to um, take a picture. He was a middle school student, and uh, the teachers would write assignments and sometimes notes on the board that they'd have to remember. So he would take a picture of it sometimes and then write it down later, which helped him because his fine motor skills were, he had some fine motor needs. So, um, so that really helped him, and it, it saved him some, some stress of having to be right down quickly and not be able to read what he wrote. Good. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. That's one suggestion that yeah. I can think of now. <laughs> okay. Uh, another question that came through today is, how do you handle students who blurt out in class? That's another good question. This is also very common. Um, well, I think students who blurt need some specific one-on-one -on -one instruction on how to control their blurts out. Um, like the, the, the doctor in the video said, kids have race car minds with bicycle brakes. And I think with blurting, that's a good example, is they just can't stop it. They just, they know the answer, they want to they blurt it out. So um, one strategy that I can think of um, is to teach them, maybe provide a visual for them that reminds them to take a deep breath. After the teacher asks the question, take a deep breath, repeat the question inside their head, and then raise their hand to answer the question. So provide a visual of three steps. So when I ask you a question, I want you to um, repeat what I asked. Um, what was the next thing I said? Oh, no, first take a deep breath, <laughs> repeat what I asked, and then raise your hand. So just to slow them down a little bit. Mm -hmm. Good. Looks like we have time for one more question. Okay. So we'll address one more and then we'll wrap it up today. Uh, the last one was that we, this was kind of a duplicate, quite a few people asked about this, uh, whether or not there are any known with ADHD. That's a good question. Um, like um, in the video, remember how Julia mentioned both her mom and dad have ADHD? Um, genetics is the most common cause that's known. Um, there are other possible causes. Uh, I think there's still a lot of research out there, but um, possibly certain toxins like alcohol and tobacco, possibly lead, um, you know, that can affect a developing fetus. Um, but, I mean, I think there's just so much that needs to be learned yet, and what areas of the brain are affected, what genes are affected. Um, so, Great answer. <laughs> no, but that doesn't help you have a better understanding of the potential mm -hmm. causes and what we can do as a society to help, you know, mm -hmm. make sure that we're taking care of ourselves. Right, right. Wonderful. Well, thank you to all of you for joining us today for the webinar on ADHD. We certainly hope that you enjoyed the presentation. And once again, it will be available on our website. And we will email you a link to all of the resources that we shared with you today. And also, we will address any questions that we didn't have time for this afternoon. We appreciate you taking the time to join us for the webinar. And have a good evening. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Good night.